Hello and welcome. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, zero trust supply chains with Project Six Store and Spiffy. My name is Andres Vega, and you are Jake Sanders. If you're new to the Spiffy project, um, the community was involved in the authoring of a book uh, with everything from planning, architecting, implementing, operating. Spiffy inspired deployments at scale, borrowing from the experience of practitioners who've deployed Spire ranging from highly regula regulated industries to web scale companies. Uh, the book is available online on, at spiffy.io slash book. Uh, it's free. Uh, we also have print copies available upon request. Uh, certainly an excellent resource if you're new to the project or if you have been a practitioner for a while uh, to get a refresher also. Jake, you want to tell us about yourself, please? Uh, my name is Jake Sanders. I'm one of the maintainers on SigStore. Um, I've been working on it since uh, mid last year or so, a bit of around mid last year. Um, previously, I was at Google and Amazon. Um, and then my co-host. You worked on some notable projects at Google. Oh yeah, I worked on, like I was on the container registry and GKE at Google, um, spent my last year and a half at the company on the Google open source security team. Um, you know, when they s sort of spun out SigStore, like co-founded it with uh, a couple of others from Red Hat. Awesome. I am Andres, I work at Control Plane. Control Plane is a offensive security company specialized on cloud native security. Uh, we do all sorts of engagements ranging from threat modeling, pen testing, security architecture, and automation. Uh, it, we're here to help with any of your security needs in attacking and defending Kubernetes. Also, I am on the steering committee of the Spiffy project. I've been involved in the, pro in the project approximately for five years in different aspects of product, program, and uh, project management. I authored the Spiffy security assessment in preparation of the project moving from sandbox to incubation. I also led the preparation of due diligence for moving from incubation to graduation. I've also participated in a few other efforts uh, through CNCF Tax Security. It's nice to see fellow tax security members here. We recently uh, published a supply chain security best practices guide. It is available in the tax security repo. And as a addendum to that as a sequel, we also wrote down a reference architecture of a secure software factory. Uh, all of these resources are open source. I invite you to check that out. Give us feedback if it's something useful. If there are gaps, uh, we'd love to hear from you. So let's get into the subject. Uh, what is a, a software supply chain, Jake? Well, a supply chain is everything from creating the code to checking out the code to building the code to deploying the code and everything else you might want to do with it. <laughs> and why would it be important to secure it? Uh, because mean people like to, you know, mess with your software at every sort of step of the way. Um, I sure, I probably don't have to tell anyone in the room that, you know, software supply chain is a big issue these days. Um, basically, what the industry has had to deal with is not really having a good foundation to build upon in order to secure every piece of the software supply chain that they might need to. Uh, but now we're getting things like the... Um, executive order that is mandating that you know people working with the government have to have certain certain levels of supply chain readiness um, we're seeing a whole bunch of initiatives from all sorts of companies including you know google and things like six store just in order to deal with it um, it's a very good time to be in the space and it's a very good time to be looking how to actually solve this problem for yourselves it is a full-time job to keep up with the threats. Uh, the community uh, led an effort pioneered by Santiago Torres Arias from Purdue to catalog uh, cloud-native su supply chain compromises. This is available in the tax security repo. Uh, links on the screen. Uh, here's a snippet. Uh, the list is 
much more extensive um, is, a, is a good breakdown to develop understanding of the threats we're faced with and uh, how adversaries may attempt to exploit vulnerabilities. So let's ele elevate the discussion for, for a second, uh, looking holistically at software and where we're at today, where we come from. With the advent of cloud, uh, applications evolved to be larger distri distributed systems composed by a number of smaller pieces. If we look at high profile compromises that have occurred since, there is the common denominator of man in the middle attack, exfiltrated credentials as the entry vectors of how attackers gain a foothold. And, and why is that, how did that precipitate? Well, with the cloud, the perimeters evaporated. As we have larger number of endpoints communicating across security boundaries, communicating across platform and cloud boundaries, all of this traffic is, is exposed. Uh, the perimeter, as I said, is non-existent. It's a really brittle barrier for anyone to gain a, a foothold onto it. So there is a need to drive down trust to zero, reduce the number of assumptions we have. Typically, uh, traditionally, access control has been implemented by the use of API keys and shared secrets to grant access to a particular resource. These secrets, this key material, must be secured. So you encrypt that. And encrypting it, you need a decryption key. And now you have yet another secret you need to protect. And this is a problem of infinite regression, turtles all the way down, you end up ultimately having a collection of keys. Some end up in paper. You end up putting these on a physical secret store, uh, probably even a bank, to uh, ensure the confidentiality of that to, in order to protect it. Now, uh, it's not a great model. It presents a lot of risk. Uh, and what we post it is, how can we move away from proof of possession onto what be the equivalent of fingerprinting and retina scanning code. In the event that this material should ever be uh, exfiltrated, it has very little utility if the life cycle is as close down to zero as possible and it's dynamically rotated. Based upon that, uh, the community gathered and evaluated uh, best practices of large-scale organizations that were further down the road of solving this problem. We externalized these best practices and codify them under uh, the SPIFI specification. SPIFI stands for Secure Production Identity Framework for Everyone. It defines a set of interfaces and uh, documents for managing the life cycle of identity and how to um, distribute this key material and for services to cross-authenticate to one another. Then we have Aspire, which is the software implementation. It applies the SPIFI specification so you can consume it within your platforms, within your software infrastructure. There are several, several reasons why you'd be compelled to use SPIFI and Aspire. One is you can drop MTLS in one fell swoop. You can also reduce, once again, the likelihood of breaches by driving down the utility time of that credential in the event that it would be exfiltrated. It does create a, an identity control plane. It creates an identity abstraction that you can rely to do high velocity PKI and not have to worry about how do I teach my app to do TLS? How do I teach my app to talk to this other service securely? If I have a, a Kubernetes spot that needs to talk to a Lambda, how do I exchange this identity document for an SDS and have an IAM role binding and move away from managing that material manually? There's, there's a range of specifications codified within the standard. There is the notion of identities that represent the, the name of the object that's being issued to. Uh, that gets embedded within an X509 or a JSON web token. 
There is a specification for the API or how are applications to retrieve and this credentials. There's the trust bundle that is the collection of public keys to authenticate the far end of a call. And federation, which is how to exchange, uh, how to exchange uh, these sets of keys across different platforms o over OIDC federation. Uh, in the interest of time, since we start a little late, I'm not going to dwell too much on trust mains. Uh, the slides will be available uh, online. You can uh, reference uh, the trust main section. Now, moving on to the software implementation, uh, this is what a typical Aspire deployment looks like. You have a Spire server that manages the registry of all of these identities, and it's concerned in it's concerned with uh, the issuance, it's concerned with uh, rotation of root certificates also. And uh, the second key component in the architecture is the Aspire, the Aspire agent, which serves the workload API to uh, containers, to any application that uh, you're attempting to spiffy enable. The API that the agent exposes uh, when a workload gets instantiated uh, and has no notion of uh, who it is, who is it supposed to talk to, uh, comes up confused, who, who am I, goes from something that's never been seen before the infrastructure, how does this transition to something that we understand well what it is, have determined its identity with certainty, uh, therefore we can fair access control. Uh, that process of introspecting uh, the application uh, gets initiated by the workload API. You see here uh, kernel, Kubernetes, and Docker. The, the workload API uh, ensures that the calling workload, uh, what's the SDID, what is the user group? What do we know from Kubelet? What's the namespace? What's the service account? If it's running on... Uh, a Docker container, what are the environmental variables? What are the labels? What's the image ID? If you're running on a cloud platform, it can interrogate, say, if it's AWS, the instance metadata API to determine what VPC, what availability zone. And if all these attributes match policy, then the identity gets issued its credential and uh, passed on through the workload API. Now, having given you that overview of Spiffy and Spire, I'm going to pass it on to Jake to talk about Project Six Store and problem solves and where, where does it uh, intersect with Spiffy and Spire. All right. So, as I mentioned, Six Store's raison d'etre is helping you solve the most fundamental issues in creating, you know, a cryptographic root of trust and actually, you know, using it. So the you know, actual root of trust itself, the services that are built on top of that, and the tooling which, rely on, which relies on those services in order to actually make uh, attestations about you know, what, how, an at, how an artifact was built, you know, where it came from, who contributed to it, um, everything you might need in order to uh, avoid many classes of attacks that uh, people are most worried about nowadays, you know, because they keep on popping up in the news. It's very nice for us. Um, so basically, the fundamental, the core projects of SIGSTORE are FullCO, which is our cert like sort of general purpose certificate authority. Um, think of it a bit like uh, Let's Encrypt, but for binaries. Um, there's ReCore, which is our transparency log. Um, it, the transparency log allows us to do something very interesting and very, very magical, which is keyless signing, uh, which is to say uh, you create a key pair, you sign an artifact with it, you send the signature to FullCO, it gives you a certificate, and then that, uh, that certificate goes in the transparency log, and that log will allow you to determine that, like, yes, this identity had this key at this time. You know, there's no worries about it getting, you know, getting lost somewhere, getting used somewhere else because like that key only needed to be around for a, the split second it took in order to create that certificate. Um, 
And this is sort of like the core value proposition of SIG store and upon which we are building from there. Uh, like I said, we're kind of made, we're, we're solving the bottom turtles for you, you know, so to speak, in, in terms of uh, this, <laughs> what, what, what we're putting forward as the value proposition. Um, those turtles are, like I said, the root of trust, uh, full CO and recor, which are built on top of it. And then finally, the uses that you put them to. So a couple of the most popular uh, utilities that we have put out currently are cosine and get sign. Uh, one, you know, cosine is to sign container images and also add attestations, SBOMs, et cetera, to your container, like to your container images so that you can make, um, you can make attestations about them at runtime. Um, and th this, this is where, oh, and there's also get sign, which is pretty self-explanatory. You can sign your git commits, good stuff. You know, it's always been really difficult. I don't know if any of you have had to manage PGP keys in order to like get old old style get signing work or, yeah, it, it's, it's awful. Use get sign instead and do it. You should do it. It's super easy, try it out. Um, if you don't like it, money back. Um, but the way, but this is where Spiffy comes in. Uh, if you really, really, really want to make it easy and already have like a spiffy Spire-based architecture, well, SigStore loves you too. Uh, we support spiffy identities through OIDC. Um, if you happen to be using Spire, they have a reference implementation of an OIDC server that um, allows you to translate uh, your uh, verifiable identity documents into you know actual identity tokens and you know attest identities in the actual spiffy, you know, parlance. So you can see um, you have like your, your domain, your organization, uh, you know, this is an example of a uh, SIG store policy controller configuration. So it's attesting the identity of someone that has signed a container image. Um, in this case, you know, uh, cluster it, this domain in this namespace with, you know, this service account, that kind of thing. So everything you would expect from a Spiffy ID, and it just works. You know how I said, know your customers? Uh, we say, know your robots. We want to make sure that every single component carrying out a task in your CI, CD has been strongly attested, has gone through that workload attestation process, uh, has a granular canonical identity that we can reason about, understand every single subject and object that encompasses the, the build pipeline. Uh, so this is where a demo of that would actually go, but the demo gods, apparently my uh, sacrifice to them was found wanting and I was smote. Um, so here's a basically basic architecture of what was supposed to go on. Um, I'm turning the demo into a tutorial, so if any of you guys would actually like to, you know, put this into practice with like a spiffy, you know, existing spiffy architecture. Um, I will be sure to let you know how to do that later on. But basically, like you can see the CI CD system, which is creating the artifacts. Um, it, it's using, you know, it, it's a, it's using Spire based uh, identity. Um, it is using uh, this verifiable identity document within the workload or like it, it has access to the Spire agent the work, sorry, the workload has access to this fire agent, is using that identity to uh, s like ask for a signing certificate from Fulcio. Fulcio then goes back and asks the OIDC server that you know, is the authority for these identities, did this actually come from you? Yes, all right. Fulcio will mint a certificate. Uh, the CICD server sends it to Recore. Recore gives it you know, its own uh, transparency log entry. Um, then finally, the CICD system will, uh, and basically all of all of this operations with full CO recore, and the OIC, OICD server, and the container registry all happen within like the context of cosine. So like a single a single command within the context of your CICD system will handle all of that for you. But the signatures go to container registry. Um, that part is done. Once uh, the workload actually wants to be deployed to a cluster that is, uh, you know, being managed by this policy controller, uh, you do a kubectl apply dash f, you know, some pod, 
the policy controller will resolve that uh, image to its digest. It will look for the signatures on that digest. Um, it'll look for the, uh, look, look at the policies like the one described in the previous page. Um, it will look at the signatures for that image. It'll say, okay, this image was, uh, was signed by the workload associated with this spiffy identity. Um, and that was attested by this identity authority, the OICE server, um, all good, and we'll let it run. So that, that's a lot of work for like all of two commands that are the core of the demo. But unfortunately not. Anyway, so here's some further reading. Uh, the first link is a link to the, what would have been the demo, but it is now turning into a tutorial. Uh, if you uh, follow that repo, I promise I will create a release once it is like fully ready. Um, I'll actually take the time to explain all of the pieces and how they fit together. So if you already have a pre-existing infrastructure that you would just like to put SigStore into, hopefully that will be a good resource for you. Um, furthermore, there's some other uh, reading related to the integrations between uh, Cosine and Spiffy that should be interesting. Yep. Thank you for thank you for coming. You have a question? I can pass the microphone. If you can go back to your demo slide, I want to understand which component is actually doing the digital signing and which is actually attaching, generating and attaching um, uh, what do you call them? Attestations mm -hmm. uh, here. And I understand that policy controller is actually validating that. But in the process where my code is getting pushed, starting from that point to the, uh, you know, to, to, to the repo, how is it getting signed? How is it getting attestation attached to that mm -hmm. and all that stuff in this diagram? Right. So you could just imagine that, like, uh, somewhere within the CI/CD system, you just pretend that some workload has access to the cosine binary. Like it builds a container image, it pushes the container image, then it says, "Cosine sign that image," and that's when all of the rest of this stuff happens. That's when it goes out and gets the, the signing certificate from Fulcio. Fulcio go go ahead and goes ahead and asks the OIDC server if you know this thing is real. Um, Okay, Fulcio gives you your signing certificate. Uh, Cosign will automatically upload that to Recore. Then you get your transparency log entry. Um, finally, you know, once all of that is done, uh, Cosign will bundle that all up into this um, signature manifest, upload it to the container registry in like a well-known area, you know, in the same repository as the image that you've pushed. Um, then it's all done. That's like the, that could be the end of the CICD system, but usually like the CD part is, you know, after cosine sign, it would do kubectl apply and, you know, tell the cube API server to, you know, then pull that image. So like attestation, you know, implying uh, stuff like you have, sent it through a, like a vulnerability analyzer, for instance. Um, what you can do at the same time is you can also use Cosign to quote unquote attach attestations like that, um, which are just like a special flavor of certificate. It's just a certificate with you know, a more interesting signature kind of. Um, so the, really the only difference between the two is you know, what commands you use in order to create them. But you can, you can attach arbitrary binaries, like arbitrary data, to an image. Every single one of these components has been pre-attested by Spire. So the moment you, you bring up the setup you see on screen, uh, each of these would have called the local workload API, uh, gone through that uh, selection of does the policy match in order for, these workload, for this workload to be issued an, an identity. Uh, that's all performed by Spire agent. That generates the CSR that gets sent to Spire server. Spire server signs that. Uh, the key material is propagated back. Does that answer your question?
Yeah. Awesome. A uh, couple more questions. Justin Capo's in the back, or? Uh, sorry, here. Uh, so clearly your, your talk here was about the code and the progression of that uh, through, but I'm just curious, assuming you are using an OIDC system for authentication, uh, what do you do then for, say, the CI system, which is actually building the images that are being loaded into the registries and say, yes, it, you need to authenticate that the code going into those is good, but what does the CI system itself do? It's obviously not going to be communicating back to with an OIDC chain, but maybe it has some kind of uh, refresh token or maybe it's got a TLS cert or something. What is the level? Yeah, there? and like that's up to implementation. You know, there's sort of like uh, ambient tokens like you have on, you know, GitHub and all the cloud providers. That's one form of identity token. Um, there's, you know, what Spire does and there's just an agent. You talk to it through a socket. Um, it's like, you know, as long as there's an OIDC identity token that is created somehow, uh, that's sort of all we need to know. And, you know, but also be able to verify. But that chain is part of what goes into, I mean, clearly it would go into the log, but is that also part of the signing process? Uh, in other words, if you go into the container and look at the image, is there some kind of signatory of the CI and that chain entirely back? without having to go to the transparency log? So Fulcio actually has to trust the OIDC server. You know, the public, the public instance that we have put out, it trusts, you know, Microsoft, GitHub, um, Google, and a, I think one, exactly one Spiffy-based public OIDC endpoint. Um, and like, if you are implementing a public OIDC identity authority, um, there is a uh, utility in, in the Fulcio repo that will allow you to create a PR to add yourself to it. Um, but the alternative is just standing up Fulcio on your own, and that's what I was doing for the demo. Um, <laughs> and just like trusting it in the config. So you, you know, obviously you have, like the, the SSL root of trust is its own separate thing, but you also, you know, add a configuration for like this is the specific in and like a list of endpoints that I trust. And as long as uh, the endpoint is like the issuing authority in the identity token. Yeah. But um, no, we don't specifically bundle like the entire like cert chain for, you know, your specific OIDC provider in uh, the signing cert for the uh, the artifact. Okay, I have, I think, a quick last question. Uh, so, first of all, thanks for the tough shout out. Um, and secondly, I'm a little curious about how some of the namespacing, you handle a lot of namespacing issues, which uh, is always kind of a problem here. Are all the OIDC servers equally trusted, and how do you, uh, because that seems problematic. Yeah. Uh, that's an excellent question, and no, they are not. Uh, so like I said, uh, you have to, OIDC providers are explicitly trusted in the config for full CO. Um, there is one, like, a, a trusted OIDC providers of record that, you know, our public good instance uses. Uh, like I said, those are like Google, Microsoft, uh, GitHub, et cetera. Um, but you must explicitly trust it. There's no... You, you can't like have another OIDC provider that's just like, oh yes, I am Google, here, here is Sergey at google.com. It was signed by him. But, but you your know? users do end up trusting all of those. It, in other words, like GitHub could claim, could, could provide certificates or things like this, it, even if they're for other types oh. of, yeah. Sorry, one thing that I, sorry, one problem. thing I did not include in this, um, oh actually, yes I did. Okay, so you can see that the, you have, you may and you absolutely should explicitly trust an issuer in your like client side policy. Um, like the specific, the specific providers that are allowed for, you know, in, in SigStore's own, you know, uh, you know, representative full CO instance are just things that make sense and are not problematic. But um, like I said, you can stand up your own and you can do anything with it. Um, Users always have the option of not, you know, setting the provider that they want to trust, but, you know, that is its own issue. So in pretty much all of the examples we give, 
uh, we, we encourage people to set the exact identity provider that should be issuing this identity. So just to make sure I understand this, so let's say that I'm running something like uh, PyPI slash warehouse for the Python community where anybody can go and, you know, get an account and do things like this. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that um, at the moment that as a developer, I decide that I'm going to use OIDC with this, then how does, how does PyPI slash warehouse indicate that then that identity has to come from Google and couldn't come from GitHub, for instance? Or is that something, is that level of isolation possible? Do you understand what I'm getting at? Yeah, no, it, it, that level of isolation is totally possible. It's, it's in the issuer. So it's like, you know, when you get an identity token, the issuer is one of the fields in, you know, this gigantic ugly jot. So it's, it's, there is an ambiguity unless you really want it. Uh, and it is totally, totally possible to, you know, narrow down the, like, explicitly say, no, only, I, only these identities come from here. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>